Well, good morning, Holy Cross. Good to uh, see y'all. Good to have you here uh, in worship. Uh, welcome. I uh, would like uh, as well to uh, welcome our folks who are watching remotely. Uh, glad uh, to have you and whoever may be watching at a later time. Uh, we're, uh, we're glad that you're able to uh, be with us uh, virtually uh, and in that way. Uh, if you're here, uh, we would invite you to fill out that connection card. It uh, just uh, helps us keep track of uh, everybody and uh, you can either leave that in the pew at the end of the service or you can drop it off uh, in the plates uh, in the back. Uh, and as I mentioned, the plates, we will not be passing uh, the plates for offering, uh, but we do uh, have them in the back. So on your way out, uh, you can drop off your tithes and your offerings uh, and, and worship the Lord uh, in that way. I don't have uh, anything else by way of announcement, so I would invite everybody to stand, kind of greet each other or however you can these days. And uh, we'll sing our opening song. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give ear, O Lord, to the prayers of your people, and listen to their cry for mercy. Lord of mercy.
Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that ever mindful of your final judgment, we may be stirred up to holiness of living here and dwell with you in perfect joy hereafter. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And please be seated for the reading of Scripture. from Isaiah chapter 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. Can please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew the 13th chapter. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. 
The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous who shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears, let him hear. And this is the gospel of the Lord. And please be seated as we sing. chapter 8 today, so I will go ahead and pray, and we will dig right in. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the folks gathered here. I thank you, Lord, for the folks who are watching at home. Uh, I ask, Lord, that you would be with us as we open up the pages of Scripture. Uh, Lord, guide my teaching. Uh, Be with my hearers as well. We commend our time to you. In Jesus' good name, amen. So I'm going to look mostly today at Romans 8, verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Um, Seems fairly apropos uh, to look at a verse like that. Uh, The question I want to dig into today is, and, and do it from the Bible, why do we have a world like the one that we have that is so permeated by pain and difficulty and strife and hardship? Why are things the way that they are. You may uh, have watched, and it came out a number of years ago, but it was a documentary on PBS uh, based on a best-selling book entitled Emperor of All Maladies, and it is a history of 
cancer as we know it in the world, its horrors, our battle against it. 7.2 million people die of cancer in the world every year, and here in America, about 600,000 people die of cancer every year. There is not a person in this room or watching at home who has not had cancer touch their lives in the form of themselves, a family member, a friend, a loved one. It's just behind heart disease and what it does. Uh, and so we're watching that, and uh, that, that's something that you consider and you think about the brokenness of the world in which we live. Now, uh, as we consider our own situation, Christians, we are very complex, very emotional people, and if you have your eyes open, if you are in tune with the Word of God, you recognize that, and you see that the world is a complex place. It is a beautiful place, and it is a horrible place. You walk outside right now, and it's beautiful, right? The sun is shining. The trees are green. We had rain a couple of days ago. We have family and friends. That's beautiful. And in hospitals, there are people fighting for their lives. It is a horrible place, and it is a beautiful place. And inside of us, those of us who belong to Jesus, we hear these words, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so in this world, there is a wedding every day and there is a funeral every day at, at the same time all over the world, right? It happens. And even in our own lives, we always know that we know that there's somebody who's weeping and there's somebody uh, who is happy on the top of the world. And that means that 2 Corinthians 10, 6 is true, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And you don't have to be a Christian for very long to know that that is true, that that's possible, that that's our reality. And I know this is possible. You may not have lived long enough to taste it, but it is possible to be simultaneously profoundly sad and profoundly happy. Simultaneously, not sequentially, right? We're complicated people. We should not think of all calamities as exceptional. Like, occasionally there's a calamity, occasionally there's something bad that happens. Look, 50 million people die in the world every year. 5,700 people every hour, 95 every minute. Breathe in, breathe out, four people have died. That's the truth. And they probably haven't told you this lately, but about 7,000 people die every day in the United States. And it was true this time last year, and that number has not increased significantly in the past few months. You can look it up. Calamities are not exceptional. It just breaks the surface of the ocean of sorrow in which we live. And it's naive to think that there are good times and bad times sequentially. There are good times and there are bad times, always, all the time, simultaneously. And if you walk through the world with a heart that is ready to weep with those who weep and ready to rejoice with those who rejoice, you will be a very strange but very wonderful person right? And you know people like this. And so, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed with us. So, why do we have a world like this? Why is there so much pain? Why is there so much conflict? Why is there so much suffering? Why is there so much death? It's a horrible place. It's a beautiful place. Right? Millions of people right now are weeping their eyes out over the sorrows of their lives, even as we speak. So, God has ordained in his mercy that sometimes very unbelieving people wake up to his reality because of pain, not because of its absence, because of the pain. So, suppose that you're a professor at a university and you're into the postmodern mindset and ideas of, well, what's right for you is right for you, what's right for me is right for me, uh, what's wrong for you is wrong for you, what's wrong for me is wrong for me. Uh, we're not going to impose our moralities on each other, right? There's not one absolute right, there's not one absolute wrong, good and evil, good and bad, 
beautiful and ugly. And that's just rampant thought in our culture and our society today. It's out there. And the deal is that way of thinking is going to come to an end very, very quickly when that person walks into a nightmare themselves. Right? When you see firsthand. When you see firsthand that 6 million Jewish people were murdered during World War II. 60 million in Stalin's regime. Gulags. Or the Armenian genocide of the Turkish people. They killed a million and a half uh, Armenians between Turkey and Syria during the First World War. Do you know about that one? So you walk into that. A lot of them Christians, by the way. And so you walk into that, and as someone who's been playing word games on tenure with students, if you're a professor, and talking to them about this world in which we live, it's nonsense that what's right for you is right for you, and what's right for me is right for me. You're confronted with evil, and you have to admit this is evil, and then suddenly you realize what you said, that that's reality. You no longer mean, well, if you think it's evil, then you can think it's evil, but I don't have to do that because that's not... No, it, it's evil. It's bad. And you've just broken every rule in your philosophy, and you can't deny what you're saying. That's evil. And I don't mean evil in the sense of somebody's chemical synapses are misfiring in an evolutionary timeline. It's real. It's significant. It matters. It's bad. This is evil. So where does that come from? It either comes from God or, 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 or doesn't exist. Right? Either there's an arbiter of good and evil over the universe, or we're all just guessing. And I would submit to you that it is the God of the universe who sets things forth and who tells us what's good and bad. And he gives it to us in his word that we read here every week and that I hope you read every day. So, why is there evil in the world? Why do bad things happen? Why is it all so difficult? I'm going to give you some ideas here. I'm going to give you four ideas to answer that question. Okay, take a deep breath, take these home, test these on all things. First of all, God planned redemption. The reason that calamities in this world exist is because God planned a history of redemption before the foundations of the world. And according to that plan, God permitted sin to enter into the world through our first parents, Adam and Eve, so that there could be a history of merciful redemption from sin. Here's what it says in 2 Timothy 1. God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So, God gave us grace in Jesus, right? It is a blood-bought grace. It is undeserved by us. It is planned before the foundations of the world through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so in order to have a world in which that comes true, there had to be sin. So God ordained that. It is not sin to will that sin exist and happen. So we're in the 21st century here. We receive by faith, grace through Jesus and his work on the cross because God ordained it before the foundations of the world. God planned this. Now, number two, God subjected creation to futility. Right? The reason calamities and conflicts and disease exist is because, is because God subjected the natural world to futility. God put the natural world under a curse. And so the physical realities of that curse, of that futility, of that corruption are here. They are a picture, they are a parable of the horrors of moral evil. That is sin. See? So bad things in this world are an illustration 
of how bad, wicked, and awful sin is in the sight of a holy God. Right? We can get just a glimpse of it when we see difficult things and difficult times. Nature exists as a signpost of what God sees as well. And so that's how we picture it. Right? And think about it. Think back to our first parents, Adam and Eve. Perfect, sinless, the world, perfect, no pain, no death, everything is perfect, and they eat the forbidden fruit, and God strikes the world with a curse. Now, in his sin, Adam struck back at God, right? I don't trust you, Lord, to provide for my best life. I think I know the better life. I reject your love. I reject your wisdom. I reject you, and I vote for me, and I will do things my way. See, that is a blow to God's face. And as a result, we've had thousands of years of horrible misery in this world. Now, and you think about that, and I use this phrase that Adam and Eve represented us well. And by that, I don't mean they did the right thing, because they didn't. But if you and I were in their shoes, we would have done the same thing. So, and we just read it earlier, right? And, and let's look at eight... From 18 to 21, I'll read a little bit more than I did earlier. The suffering, well, I'll be right here. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's what we're seeing in this world. That's what we see when, when we see loss of eyesight, lots of, loss of healing, when we see cancer, when we see disease, when we see pandemic. The creation is subjected to futility, and it doesn't happen willingly because God subjugated it in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage of corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The Bible explains all of this. And that's why we say things like, hasten the day, O God. Right? Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. I'm ready. It's time from my perspective. So when Adam and Eve sinned morally, the world was touched physically. And so Adam insulted God in a way of infinite proportions because he's an infinite God. And then God subjected the physical world to futility. Third idea. Jesus is more precious than anything that we lose. So the reason that all this calamity, all this misery, all this conflict exists is so that Followers of Jesus, in the Old Testament, followers of Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, would be able to experience and display the profound God-honoring truth that Jesus is more precious to us than everything we could lose in this world. A world of loss exists so that you and I, not by our murmuring or complaining or getting angry at God, but by resting in him, trusting in him, we could show the world and testify to our own consciousness that God is more precious to us than everything or anything that we could lose. Philippians 3, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Right? Everything goes to the side. Here's what it says in Habakkuk 3. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the, pro- the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, and here's where it turns, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Now, Habakkuk's talking about a dire situation, right? There's nothing to eat. 
That means you die. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. So that's why famine exists, right? So that Christians who are swept away in the famine will bear witness and say God is better than food. God is all satisfying to my soul even as I die of starvation. God's better. Philippians 2. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, we fail at this all the time, especially with social media. Right? I'm a, I'm a born murmurer. Right? Murmur, murmur, murmur. I hate myself when I murmur because it's a statement that God is not better than what we're murmuring about. And I need to repent of that, and we all do. Last idea. Jesus needed to suffer and die. And I think this one's the most important. Okay? The world exists with its pain, with its sorrow, with its death to make a place for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to suffer and die. And if a world like this didn't exist, Jesus would have no place to suffer and die. And if there were no suffering, Jesus couldn't suffer. If there were no death, Jesus couldn't die. And that's the reason. God showed his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinner, sinners, Christ died for us. That's how he showed his love. Here's what it says in Acts 4. Okay, this is being prayed by the saints after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Truly in this city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy, holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. Herod, who mocked him, put a purple robe on him, scorned him. Pilate, who washed his hands and said, I find no fault in him, but because I want to keep my job, I will kill him, I will crucify him, I will put him through the worst tortures imaginable. To the Gentiles, that's the soldiers, they drove the nails, they pushed the sword in his side. To the Jewish people shouting, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Those things, the text says, God predestined to take place. Jesus did not die by accident. It is not just a fluke of history, not just mob violence. This was planned since before the foundations of the world. And it's the reason for existence that the Son of God, bearing all the suffering of the world in order to lift sin from all who would trust him and he would bring them into everlasting reward and joy ultimately to new heavens and new earth, glorifying God for his wisdom, for his grace, for his love. And that's the reason this world exists the way it exists. So I invite you to embrace Jesus Christ as the one for whom, through whom, by whom, to whom all things exist. And he came to share this suffering and he came to bear this pain. And he came to taste every test of temptation that we have known. And he came to take it to the cross, to die in our place, so that by faith alone, we can have our sins forgiven, we can have eternal life, we can have a destiny with a new heaven and a new earth, we can have joy in him, we can have relationship with one another, we can live in all these things that the curse would finally, that the curse would ultimately be lifted and we live in eternity with him in everlasting righteousness and innocence and blessedness. This is most certainly true. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. I thank you, Lord, uh, that before the foundations of the earth, your Father planned for us to be saved. And so I ask, Lord, that in the midst of a world of calamity, that you would teach us to live 
in the expectation, in the knowledge that you are good, and then the expectation that you will bring ultimately to us eternal life in you. And it's for your beautiful name. Amen. Had to get a little swig of water. It's a lot of talking, you know. Uh, before we stand up for everything, just uh, I'll, I'll give you our instructions. Uh, some of you have been here for uh, communion lately, so just want to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. Um, as we prepare for communion, uh, the uh, well, the way we'll do it is one side at a time. So it'll start. We'll do this side first, the uh, lectern side, uh, and it will be continuous flow. Uh, we would ask you to kind of uh, make sure you stay in your family groups uh, as you come up and, and keep a little distance uh, that way. And uh, I will hand you the wafer, and the ushers will uh, and, and elders will be there to uh, distribute the individual uh, cups for communion. Uh, after we have done the one side, uh, then uh, and you'll come down the aisle and then loop around uh, on that side. And then when it's time for us to switch. When it's time for us to switch, I will move a little bit so that we'll be doing this side then and same procedure this way and go on around um, and keep that space uh, for those family groups. Uh, it is a great blessing uh, that we can receive uh, Christ's body and blood, his means of grace. And so uh, it's a celebration for us and uh, we want to proceed uh, in that manner. Uh, we will be standing for a while here, so uh, we don't have those usual breaks that we have of collecting the offering and stuff. So if you need to be seated at some point and take a little break. Uh, we, we understand that, and uh, that, that's an okay thing to do. So uh, let us confess our faith, and then we'll continue with the prayers, and then we'll continue with the Lord's Supper. So please stand. And we confess our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, your power holds all things together in heaven and on earth. Give wisdom to those who lead our nation and guidance to those who make, administer, and judge our laws so that life be protected and justice administered. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your word speaks hope and life. Open our ears to hear your voice and our hearts to believe in Jesus Christ and follow him as Savior and Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your church lives by the grace you bestow through word and sacrament. Bless the pastors who preach to us this gospel and the church workers who serve us in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your mercy extends to all our needs and your grace gives healing according to your will. Hear us on behalf of Susan Ludwig, uh, Jen Micken, and Pam Withrow, uh, and others who we name in our hearts, and all who stand in need. Grant to them grace sufficient for all their needs, and sustain them in the hour of trial. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you have granted us a place at the table of your Son. Help us to receive his body and blood with repentance and faith, and to keep in holy lives the precious gift we will receive upon our lips. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear us as we pray, Lord, the prayer that you have given us. Our Father...
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night on which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. Now may the partaking of this holy meal strengthen and preserve you steadfast in true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Now receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.